Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvain Lézé from the Department of Aeronautics at Imperial College London, and this is the new episode of the podcast Turbulence at the Exascale. So if you're not familiar with the podcast, we are trying to gather the view of the community regarding the challenge and opportunities associated with uh, the exascale uh, computing and in particular for uh, simulating turbulent flows. So this podcast is part of the initiative called uh, uh, Excalibur, which is the UK answer to uh, the transition to uh, the exascale era. It is led by the Met Office, the UK Atomic Energy Authority and the UK Research and Innovation. And its main goal is uh, to uh, design uh, new uh, software to harness the power of um, uh, exascale computing. And this uh, podcast is also linked to the UK uh, Turbulence Consortium, which is a group of academic uh, dedicated to the study of uh, turbulence using uh, the UK supercomputing facilities. So I'm very pleased to say that uh, today we have a guest uh, from the University of uh, Southampton, it's uh, Dr. Ralph uh, Ditterding, who is Associate Professor in Fluid Dynamics uh, within the Engineering and Physical Science at the University of Southampton. His research interests are in the development of um, algorithm for, for CFD, of course. He's interested in uh, massively parallel uh, Cartesian automatically adapted methods for hypersonics and weakly compressible flows with or without structure. Uh, fluid structure interaction and um, with or without multiphysic coupling. So uh, good afternoon, uh, Ralph. Hello, so welcome uh, very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us here on this uh, podcast. And uh, I'm going to start with my uh, question. And can you tell us uh, a bit more about yourself, uh, where you are from, what you have studied, and uh, how did you end up at the University of Southampton? Okay, so... Um, um, my CV is a little bit uh, longer than for the typical UK academic. So um, I studied um, techno-mathematics in Germany at the University of uh, klausthal Sellerfeld. So uh, klausthal Sellerfeld is a smaller town uh, in the middle of Germany. It's kind of in the south of Lower Saxony in the area of, of Göttingen and Hanover. Um, but its um, technical university is, is quite well known in Germany. So I studied um, techno-mathematics there, which is a study that is 60% mathematics, 30% an engineering subject, and 30% computer science. So, and um, my official subject um, in engineering was continuum mechanics, um, at that time more in um, structural mechanics. Um, however, I did already then um, my PhD in um, computational fluid dynamics. I also did my diploma thesis in that area, um, while the regular lectures were more on continuum mechanics um, on the structural side. So I did this at uh, the University of uh, Cottbus in East Germany, which is uh, close to the Polish border. Um, so I finished the PhD in 2003, and this is a PhD, um, formally speaking, in applied mathematics. Mm -hmm. So my degrees are actually all in applied mathematics with aeronautical um, fluid mechanical applications, you can say, but um, officially speaking, um, all my degrees are in mathematics. Um, with these degrees, then in um, 2003, um, I got the opportunity to work at the California Institute of Technology um, as a postdoc in applied mathematics, but in close collaboration with uh, the Aeronautical Institute. Um, from that position, um, I was offered uh, a householder fellowship in scientific computing at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, also in um, computational mathematics. However, I simply continued to doing just uh, computational fluid dynamics there. Uh, and then from that position in 2013, um, I transitioned to um, a job with management responsibility at the German Aerospace Center and was group leader there for uh, two years um, in computational fluid dynamics. And then from that job, two years later, um, was hired as associate professor in fluid dynamics here to Southampton, bringing some of the topics that we did at DLR, like for instance, train aerodynamics, uh, then also to Southampton. Excellent. 
Thank you. And so you said you have a background in applied mathematics and in mathematics. So uh, how did you decide that uh, computational free dynamics and turbulent flow are, would be more interesting to study? And how, so how did you end up uh, focusing on CFD? Um, basically, because um, for me, when I studied this subject, technical mathematics, it was already clear that I really wanted to work in that area. And um, at that time, professors really had the advice that there were two topics, basically, um, you could actually make money with in, in, in mathematics. It's either complicate PDE problems or um, optimization and control, nonlinear optimization. So um, I readily studied explicitly for um, complex PDE problems, also analytic solutions of PDE problems, and then going to fluid dynamics is a small step because those nonlinear equations are obviously still unsolved. And if you then look into turbulence, of course, you have all this complex behavior that is physically not well understood. So that already at that time kind of offered a perspective to work there for a long time, for a long duration. Yeah, so also for instance, high performance computing um, was actually part of my training. Um, so I had courses at that time, it was more about uh, parallel methods for linear algebra, but of course those also play a crucial role for, for fluid dynamics. Excellent. So you have been working in Germany, you have been working in the in the US and, and in the UK. And so my next question is, uh, now that you have been in Southampton for uh, uh, quite a few years, what, what's the best thing about your uh, your current position? What do you like the most? So um, here in the UK, um, when it comes to your research at university, nobody interferes. So the best thing here is that um, the topics that I'm pursuing um, with a PhD student as well as the undergraduates, particularly the undergraduates, uh, I can completely freely choose. And whenever we have interesting topics in aerodynamics uh, or also hypersonics, supersonic flows, um, even motivated out of my own lectures, um, I find more than enough undergraduates who are very happy to work on them. So uh, one difference to my rather extensive career in laboratories Oak Ridge, as well as the German Aerospace Center, you have, when you work in such an environment, you always have constraints on the topics you are allowed to work on. Because even in, in, in CFD or in aerodynamics, um, topics would be um, dedicated potentially to other groups. And you do not have this problem here at the university. Yeah, so we can really completely freely choose. And um, because here in Southampton, we have this really big um, program in aerospace engineering, we have really lots we have more undergraduates who want to work with us than we actually can accommodate in our group that is very good excellent very good so i mean uh, i can see your poster behind you about lattice boltzmann method and it's going to be my my next question now we can we can discuss a little bit more about uh, numerics so you have become uh, over the year and a worldwide expert in lattice boltzmann method and uh, can you tell us a little bit well can you briefly introduce this approach for for um, the people who are listening who may not necessarily be very familiar with uh, this method. So um, the lattice Boltzmann idea builds directly on the Boltzmann equation. So it um, aims of approximating the Boltzmann equation directly. And um, it does this in a rather peculiar way. So the Boltzmann equation being a particle equation, what the lattice Boltzmann method does is it says, um, we are doing this readily for a continuum. We are not worrying about particles. So the original gas automata that people had before the lattice Boltzmann method, they were doing, they were working with particles and uh, particle number densities. So lattice Boltzmann method works um, with a probability distribution. Yeah, and the assumption is readily that we solve the particle equation in the continuum. That is already peculiar, um, but by doing so, it becomes a direct competitor to other solvers uh, for the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and what makes the method special is because it ultimately is a particle equation, it has um, this high dimensionality. So we have uh, for the equation uh, underpinning it, we have uh, three directions for space. And then of course we have a velocity space that we also need to span up. That uh, is another six, three degrees of unknown. So um, including the time, the equation has seven degrees of unknown. 
Yeah, and so then the lattice Boltzmann method now needs to deal with that. And it does as such that it discretizes uh, the three directions of the velocity space um, with a very particular stencil. And in the standard Cartesian method, this stencil is exactly associated uh, to the points of the lattice. And when you then do a time step update, the probability densities are shifted exactly according uh, to the stencil from one point to the other. So you end up then in this standard lattice Boltzmann method with an extremely simple transport scheme that basically using um, the sound speed um, for the time step selection, it ends up with an exact transport that is dissipation free. Yeah, and that makes the method highly suitable for turbulent flows because you end up with a dissipation free method. Now, of course, there are nowadays variations and you can also do the lattice Boltzmann method on um, finite volume meshes if you wish to even on triangular meshes. And then you do not have this perfect association of um, velocity stencil to the points of the lattice. And then the dissipation P property is given up uh, and then you end up with a method that is much more in, in behavior common to like conventional finite volume methods. But because of the simple um, collide and, and so, and then the method is formulated um, as a splitting method. And then in the second step of the splitting approach, we need to solve the Boltzmann collision integral, but this is then approximated uh, as a two particle um, assumption. And so then the Boltzmann collision integral that uh, would otherwise have to consider arbitrary number of particles colliding, it is reduced and simplified. And this is then actually where the floating point operations of the method actually lie. And it is here in the collision integral where operators widely um, would differ from one another. Yeah, so nowadays we are having not just for simple um, single physics um, gas transport, but people would have built very complex and sophisticated operators, for instance, for multi-phase flows and, and air, all their complexity is in the collision method. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, a follow-up question on the Lattice Boltzmann method. I mean, it, it, I will say that it's a fairly new method and people are still trying to improve uh, the method. So uh, can you tell us what do you think are the main challenges um, for Lattice Boltzmann method? Is there, is there like big limitations at the moment or do you think that the, the method is mature enough to study a wide range of flows? What, what's the, um, the status? So the standard method that I just described um, is of course formulated on a Cartesian mesh. Um, and here it depends what kind of problems one wants to study. Um, if I'm studying um, aerodynamical problems that can um, be perfectly approximated on a Cartesian mesh, the method would be highly capable out of the box. Yeah, if I take a more aerodynamical approach, um, where usually then geometries are not exactly Cartesian, um, of course the method is challenged. Yeah, and um, one peculiarity of the method in addition is that delta x, delta y, delta z in the lattice Boltzmann method is a constant. Yeah, um, they are all identical. And the moment that you have to approximate a boundary layer in 3D with all three spatial directions being identical, that is very inefficient in a boundary layer. Uh, so the moment that I have a complex body object, I need to make a find a compromise here. And so then uh, the exact embedded boundary conditions and how, for instance, wall functions are introduced in this method uh, to reduce the resolution requirements in the boundary layer, yeah. they take um, center state. Yeah, so, and, and they become of um, exceptional importance. And also, of course, you need to use um, non-uniform meshes to be somewhat efficient. You cannot, even if you um, provide a very high resolution close to the boundary layer, you cannot carry that forward um, into the entire domain. So um, hierarchical data structures um, for non-uniform meshes, and then automatically, because it is an explicit method, it would also come together automatically with hierarchical time steps. Yeah, so they take center state, and then a method that is actually the simplest lattice Boltzmann methods can be programmed very easily in 100 lines of code. It's a straightforward undergraduate project. Um, that is a truth. However, then to use them for real world problems, suddenly a significant and um, 
very comprehensive software infrastructure is necessary to put them then into reality. And I think here, the latest Boltzmann community originally kind of overpromised on the capabilities of the method. And over the last 10 years, it um, I think it has become pretty eminently clear that if the method in itself is so simple, that then um, the additional bits, the additional models that need to be added um, are um, significant are considerably complicated. Of course, the lattice Boltzmann method equally requires turbulence models. Um, being the standard, the standard, the, the standard method being dissipation-free, um, the stability of the method for a highly turbulent flow is very low. Uh, and this is also where a lot of research has gone. Yeah, um, from a point of view of um, the turbulent consortium, is um, the moment how to deal with high Reynolds number flows. This is also where the lattice Boltzmann community does not agree. So some people have uh, put all their efforts into very complex uh, operators to improve the stability of the method without turbulence models and then performing something like um, naive ILES yeah, versus other, and I'm more proponent of that kind, I would like to stick with a dissipation-free method and then add a turbulence model. So then at least that the turbulent, that the under-resolved bit is at least in the model that we understand physically. Mm -hmm. um, however, these models, they are inherited as usual um, from the schemes for the Navier-Stokes equation. So what the community in Lattice Boltzmann is facing that many of the models that have become commonplace for Navier-Stokes solvers have to be brought over to the Lattice Boltzmann world. Um, and that is a little bit complicated because um, the Lattice Boltzmann method, because it works on um, probability density functions. So one has these stencils where then um, for instance, the momentum transport, the three velocities are modeled, let's say, with 19 probability density functions or with 27 probability density fun functions. And it, then if you understand uh, a turbulent property, for instance, at the wall, you understand this in the so-called macroscopic quantities in the velocities that still leaves the questions, how do you impose this then on 27 variables that you are internally working with? Yeah, so you end up potentially with um, small linear systems that have to be solved. And that makes the application of more complicated models defined in the macroscopic quantities uh, more complicated. And this is where then um, people trying to apply the lattice Boltzmann method then discover that there are much more mathematical problems than originally anticipated. Great, thank you very much. And um, find, well, another question about the lattice Boltzmann method is regarding the, the, the polarization strategy and the use of high performance computing. So what's, what's, your, uh, what's your view on this? Would you say that the, the lattice Boltzmann methods are, are going to be ready for, for the, the new generation of computers or there is still a lot of work to do on that front? It depends what kind of problems you are trying to solve. So the method is an explicit, um, scheme that just requires nearest neighbor uh, information. So depending on uh, the velocity stencil, that could be just the direct, uh, the direct neighbor, or it could be two layers of neighbors. Um, but in that respect, um, <coughs> the explicit method, it scales directly linearly with the number of unknowns. Yeah, so in, in that respect, the simple method on a uniform mesh is easily scalable to arbitrary core number. The moment that you uh, overlap um, communication with computation, this method can be made to scale perfectly. Um, however, as just elaborated, the moment that um, increasingly complex submodels have come into play that might introduce non-uniform workload, like for instance, at embedded boundaries, mm -hmm. and then you have to deal with um, non-uniform data structures and hierarchical time steps that suddenly makes for a very complicated um, parallelization problems. For instance, the hierarchical time steps give you kind of a sequencing, how you have to update uh, the different resolution levels on the mesh. And that suddenly then makes for a multi-layered parallelization problem. And so there, the readiness for exascale is now, yeah, intermediate, I would say. Yeah, if it comes to the standard basic operator on a uniform mesh, that is readily readily to exascale. Yeah, that there's no doubt about that. Great, thank you very much. Um, um, I think you're also working a lot with the uh, AMROC framework. So can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, framework? Yeah, AMROC is um, our own 
in-house um, system, our workhorse for everything in which everything is implemented. So MROC is a development that already originates and dates back um, to my own PhD. Um, so it is a system for working with block structured hierarchically refined meshes. Um, they just have to be structured. And um, during my PhD and during uh, previous work at Caltech or at Oak Ridge, um, MROC was used for finite volume methods. So it's directly tailored to explicit schemes, to hyperbolic problems. And um, about, um, I would say, eight, nine years ago, I came to the realization that the lattice Boltzmann method, because the Boltzmann equation is equally a hyperbolic equation, um, it fits readily into the system. Um, it also requires a hierarchical time step. And um, what we did differently than um, making it fit into AMROC is that uh, people often formulate the lattice Boltzmann method on node-based data structures. Um, we formulate the lattice Boltzmann method on cell-based data structures. And like that, all the data structures that MROC already provided are readily applicable. And uh, so we are able to deal with the lattice Boltzmann method as with finite volume methods with the exact same um, data structures and, and uh, programming data structures. So there's a lot of reuse in MROC also for IO, et cetera, and data processing that we simply reuse. Uh, and in MROC, because it's block-based, what you ult so this is a generic framework, and what you ultimately require for different discretization is an update on the uniform block. Uh, and that makes the incorporation of new discretizations very easily. And the lattice Boltzmann method is just one update on the block. A key difference between LBM and finite volume is that in LBM, the stencils always transport over the corners. Um, and that requires some modification, but MROC and the name stands for um, Adaptive Mesh Refinement in Object-Oriented C++, um, is a real C++ framework in that sense that one has generic main programs and then one has a class hierarchy from which you can derive and modify. Yeah, so, and by derivation and modification, there's a lot of reuse of the C++ data structures. So it's just customization. Um, and that makes it very adaptable um, to new challenges. So it's a system that has evolved um, as an approach where we in C++ can program pretty much any algorithm required on these data structures, also on data processing, and it makes it very suitable for true research work. So it's very suitable for PhD work and also true research projects. Um, it is less suitable for direct CFD usage, yeah, because we do not have like um, typically, I guess, in, in, in the research community, we do not have graphical front ends on top of it. So you have to make a non-Cartesian mesh separately with a discrete different tool, and then you can load it into AMROC, and it would make the Cartesian adapted mesh then based on that. Um, and so then um, putting it to use requires some experience in programming, but then if you are at that level, it's a very capable system. And I think, um, by using this kind of framework approach, um, we can, in particular, when it comes to um, working with our own in-house code, uh, we can reuse data structures and tools that are developed for one solver system. We can effectively reuse them for another solver system. And that makes it still tractable at this level um, to basically participate in recent research and we can benefit from one another uh, in the developments. Excellent. And I, well, I wanted to double check with you that it was written in C++, but you said that. And for the polarization strategy, it's MPI, I guess. Yes, it's currently MPI and not hybrid yet. That is one of the things that next to need to be tackled now as machines have gone larger, but we have gotten rather far just with MPI only. Um, the base system is written in C++, but solvers have also been provided in Fortran 70. So basically the, the, the block update, yes. um, they can be Fortran 77, Fortran 90, C, 
And for instance, a Lattice Boltzmann method is C++ throughout. It has different interfaces. So then the moment, it's not just the discretization that does the update on the block, then you typically, to be um, compatible to the solver, you would also have the initial conditions, the boundary condition, then have in the same language. And then they connect into the system through C++ objects. But the solvers that we use, for instance, um, for the finite volume work, um, for instance, for compressible turbulence, it's a 1490 solver and the interface that the user is seeing is primarily a 1490 interface that is looking like a somewhat strange unigrid solver and underneath is then this um, C++ framework that is doing all the parallelization, all the mesh adaptation, so the user doesn't have to worry about that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and I guess it's open source, right? Or Yes, it is. It is. I, it is. As you said, as you said, you need to be uh, experienced to to enjoy the the capabilities of it. <laughs> yes, um, there are also um, patch solvers, like for instance uh, for combustion, or nowadays also for hypersonics. Mm -hmm. So we we have a very recent uh, patch solver that actually works on non-Cartesian grids, but also on structured meshes in 2D with um, overset meshes. That is a two temperature solver that also has proper air dissociation and such tools are um, <coughs> not open source readily um, because the applications that you can do with that also take a somewhat sensitive nature. So also at uh, the California Institute of Technology, MROC and the VTF system was used also for work for the Department of Energy. And uh, there is fluid structure coupling routines that are also of a somewhat sensitive nature. So you can do highly driven problems um, with high energetic materials partially mm -hmm. with the system and that is not open source. Okay, thank you for uh this uh, information. Um, now I have a, a very hypothetical question, but let's say tomorrow uh, you get access to a big uh, exascale computers. And my question is, what uh, will you do with it that you currently cannot do? What flow will you study? Also, oh, for instance, um, one work um, that you also have seen recently is so, um, we use the lattice Boltzmann method with moving embedded geometries for, mm -hmm. for wind turbine research. Yeah. Yeah. That is quite exciting work. Um, and of course, with an excess scale computer, you could definitely model an entire wind farm. Um, of course, um, this being a multi-physics, multi-scale problem, um, we also have the wind turbines. Um, so the way how we currently do the wind turbines, that would have to be parallelized better. Um, such a complicated multi-physics code, they often have um, because of the comp programming complexity, they end up with certain bottlenecks, but provided we have removed them, that would be um, a very ideal case. Another ideal case is, as I said, we um, work, so MROC has been used since my own PhD for uh, supersonic combustion simulations. Uh, and there is currently great interest in rotating detonation engines. We work mm -hmm. on this too. So we have made an experiment here in Southampton, the first, the UK's first rotating detonation experiment. Uh, and I also have uh, PhD students working on rotating detonation engines. Um, and when we want to model that in 3D, um, because the chemistry, we are trying to do this for hydrogen, um, for instance, currently for ethylene chemistry uh, with reduced mechanism, but the chemistry of course is extremely expensive. Yeah, so, and that is very expensive already in 2D and doing this in 3D, um, that would be highly interesting. One also has to admit that in um, the world of combustion simulation, particularly shock-induced combustion simulations, people struggle enormously to bring um, turbulence models into the problems. So what people in reality are doing is they are, everybody is doing under-resolved DNS computations because ultimately you would require um, a turbulence model um, for the flame in itself, but um, turbulent flame models are typically tailored for slow subsonic deflagrative phenomena, not for supersonic phenomena. So um, having resolution available for such kind of problems is of vital importance and uh, doing 3D computations, for instance, in an RDE, that would be extremely exciting. Great, thank you very much. And a, a, a more general question regarding exascale computing. I mean, you have been in the UK for quite some time now. And do you think the, the CFD community is ready for the transition to exascale or do you think we are a long way uh, behind? Mm. 
I think it depends uh, what kind of problems you are tackling. I think um, if you are um, tackling single physics problems, um, I think then the fluid community definitely is ready for exascale. If we want to just do DNS with turbulence in a box, if we want to just do the, 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 the Taylor Green vortex problem, yeah. for instance, or decaying isotropic turbulence, we are definitely ready. However, of course, the scientific benefit of such a computation would be very low. Um, it's more when we want to do um, computations that are of greater societal relevance. Um, ultimately, the driver for exascale computers, when suddenly we have to bring in something um, like multi-physics coupling or fluid structure coupling, then uh, of course our readiness for exascale is, is drastically lower. Often the codes that do these kind of problems wouldn't even be in reality ready for the petascale. Uh, yeah, so, and there definitely a lot of work has to be invested. Great, thank you very much. Um, I have two two more questions. What, so I don't know if, if you have an opinion on that. It's about hardware and uh, uh, what hardware are available for scientists like us. And uh, is there anything, I mean, are you happy with the hardware that you have at the moment or do you, th do you have uh, some uh, uh, limitation at the moment? Like is your AMROC framework li uh, limited because of memory issues or because of IOs or, and then you will need different hardware. W what's your, uh, what's your no, view on that? Um, is I mean, when it comes um, to MPI parallelization, so MROC is locality preserving, so it um, it accepts a little bit load imbalance. I think when you do mesh adaptation, in addition, you have to accept that the algorithms get more complicated and you can't parallelize and distribute work perfectly. Um, so memory is usually, and IO, IO also gets automatically reduced when you use adaptive measures. Yeah, so we can solve bigger problems with the with, with same scientific output and already have canonical mesh reduction. Also, because there is a hierarchical layering of the data, we also have automatically effectively causing data always available. Um, I think such the, the, the problem with a system like MROC comes from the com programming complexity. Um, and um, of course, when you have such investment, so MROC, the whole VTF system is in the range of several, it's, it's around two, three million lines of code. I have recently counted, but this is including all uh, the finite element solvers for fluid structure coupling that others have provided, etc. Yeah, so the core system is only in the range of, uh, for the AMR in the range of, of 150,000 lines of C++ code, but it's very dense C++ code. Um, at the moment, if you basically have to change the parallelization fundamentally, it's still quite a challenge. And mm -hmm. uh, in this block-based approach, hybrid parallelization, um, hybridizing um, MPI with OpenMP, that is relatively straightforward. Um, a challenge is, however, when accelerators come into being, where you have a completely different parallelization module. And um, my problem with accelerators so far has been, like for instance, GPUs or other accelerators, is that the programming model that the computer scientists have provided simply hasn't stabilized. So the moment that you are making a great commitment in changing a large public domain software system to a different programming module, um, you want to have a certain assurance that this is a solution for the foreseeable future. Yes. Yeah, let's say five to 10 years down the road, because I already, already elaborated on that if we do such sophisticated framework maintenance in-house with our moderately large team, half a, half a dozen to 10 people, um, we need to invest our resources uh, wisely. Yeah, so in my problem with the accelerators, we I have worked with undergraduates on the accelerators. And the problem simply is the moment that simply there is no agreement, should we use OpenCL for that? Should we use CUDA for that? Should we use some meta library? Good, <laughs> I would just like to have the insurance that this is now the solution for the next five years. <laughs> and uh, that has been, that has been um, a tremendous concern um, going forward. Yeah, so, um, and, if that would basically mature to the to the level that we can rely on this in the next five to ten years, then we would also make the commitment. Yeah, I, I only feel now basically that um, 
hybrid parallelization with, with MPI, OpenMP, that is a thing to do. And that is straightforward. With the accelerators, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, so this, this so far with our large system has not gotten beyond the prototyping stage yeah, and the exploration stage because the commitment just feels so large. Excellent, I, I fully agree with you. Thank you very much. I have one last uh, one last question. So um, there's a lot of discussion, of course, these days about the transition to exascale computing and the computing era. But my, my question is also very hypothetical. Uh, what do you think is going to come in 50 or maybe not not 50, but 25 years or 30 years? Do you think we are going still we will be dealing with MPI on CPUs or GPUs or do you think we are going to have completely new hardware like quantum computing or or do you think you will uh, finish your career on on cpus and eventually gpus i think you will always have um mpi for some distributed memory communication i cannot uh, this model is very um persistent in that respect and you will always have distributed cabinets and there will always be a lot a long latency if you communicate across cabinets. I think we are currently seeing a tendency that within the cabinet, um, one is going back to more integrated designs, yeah, where you have shared memory. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the, the the distributed memory approach, I do not see going away for the foreseeable future. Um, because um, as a system, basically, uh, a programming system, the the latency would that the, that the programming system could basically hide this in a transparent way, um, the communication overhead. Um, I do not see this happening anytime soon. Yeah, and if there are such kind of um, systems, and there have been efforts in, in such kind of transparent programming system where basically data has been shared in a transparent way, even when there was distributed memory. But I think the performance penalty that you would be taking from this and having a simple programming model um, will presumably always be too high for the, um, for the high performance um, users. Yeah, for, for simple usages, um, the penalty might be modest, but I think if you, um, if you are talking about kind of leadership users who want to really use the, the high-end machines, I think this will not this will not change. And when it comes um, to let's say quantum computing, as far as I understand this, basically the type of algorithms that we are doing are genuinely suited um, for our regular um, um, Turing machine approach. Um, yeah, so the the regular computer um, being having that underpinning model of the Turing machine, I do not see this going away because it's highly deterministic. What we do, our algorithms are highly deterministic. They have um, sequential steps that they need to take. I think they are not easily amenable to a quantum computer. Um, the way how we understand discretizations, I don't think that this will ever change. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ralph, for uh, your input and for taking the time uh, to talk to us. It was uh, really nice to listen to your uh, uh, about the Lattice Boltzmann method, about the AMROC framework, and about your view on exascale computing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And uh, thank you everyone for listening. As usual, um, you will find the link for this podcast on Twitter, UK Turbulence in one word, and you can also find all the links for all the podcast on the UK Turbulence Consortium website. Easy to find on Google, just UK turbulence in one word and, and you will find everything. So thank you very much everyone for listening and hope to see you soon um, in the new episode.